a fake image posted on Twitter has pushed Australia-China relations to a new level. Australia, a few people have made such a scandalous report. Australia's government should not feel ashamed. This is something that's calculated, thought through, and you've got to wonder what on earth the Chinese are up to by doing this. Australia's government should not feel ashamed. This is something that's calculated, thought through, and you've got to wonder what on earth the Chinese are up to by doing this. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post, where we don't cover the news, we cover the way the news is covered. Here are the media stories we're looking at this week. China, a war of words with Australia, and the tweet that escalated everything. Uganda's got a presidential election coming. Journalists are covering the story at their own risk. Serbian war criminals turned authors, rewriting history from behind bars. And saying you're not a robot is easy. Tick this box to confirm you're not a robot. Proving it is another matter. This will go down as the year of the pandemic. Given what we know about the origins of COVID-19, the initial outbreak in Wuhan, China, 2020 has also put a serious strain on Beijing's relationship with other governments. We've examined its conflict with Washington and the outgoing, presumptively speaking, Trump administration as well as the role that the media have played in that. Another story worth watching is China's relationship with Australia. This past week, a prominent government voice in Beijing sent out a tweet designed to make Australia look bad. It included an image, a fake one, of an Australian soldier supposedly stationed in Afghanistan, appearing to slit the throat of a child. The message, do not lecture China on COVID-19 or human rights. It was the latest salvo between two countries that happen to be major trading partners, now using their respective media outlets in different ways and to differing extents to trash talk one another. And journalists on both sides are finding themselves in a familiar place, trapped between competing powers. Our starting point this week is the tweet that set it all off. This is what it looks like when one country, China, trolls another, Australia, on Twitter. The image is fake. The message from Beijing was real, coming from the account of a foreign ministry spokesman, Zhao Lijian. This picture shows an Australian soldier cutting the throat of a Afghan boy who is holding a small sheep and the soldier is sitting on top of the national flag of Australia. And the caption says, don't be afraid, we're coming to bring you peace. This image was really quite shocking. When we first saw it here in Canberra on Monday, uh, a lot of us were kind of gasped. It is one of the most provocative things that another nation could do. It was even more shocking that it came from a Chinese foreign ministry official. It was clearly a deliberate provocation. It's not something that you tweet out without knowing that it's going to generate a pretty significant response. Until recent years, China's diplomats have usually been known to be quite polite and conservative. But in the past two years, some have become more assertive and combative, especially on Twitter, a platform that is actually banned in China. The rhetoric against Australia has been particularly harsh this year, and that reflects the deteriorating relationship between Australia and China. Zhao Lijian is the Chinese official who first floated the notion that the COVID-19 virus, which initially surfaced in the city of Wuhan, may have been planted by American military personnel who had attended a meeting there. Zhao has been prominent in the messaging fight between Beijing and Washington over the pandemic. And by wading into the bilateral tussle with Canberra, Zhao has turned global eyes onto an Australian story that wasn't getting much traction elsewhere. An inquiry into the conduct of Australian soldiers based in Afghanistan in 2012 and 2013, and the cold-blooded killing of civilians. The report detailed shocking crimes, including murders allegedly committed by men who were supposed to be our best-trained, most elite soldiers. 
It was payback in 280 characters or fewer for Australia's habitual criticism of China over human rights violations in Xinjiang and Hong Kong. And Prime Minister Morrison's demand that China be investigated for its handling of COVID-19. What's really important is that we have a proper review. The pandemic issue, according to supporters of President Xi Jinping's government, is the biggest factor in the widening rift between the two countries. Throughout this year, Australia has been acting as a pawn of the United States, especially when they accused China of covering up the COVID outbreak and demanded an international investigation into the origin of the virus. 今年新冠疫情期间,澳大利亚也是追随美国,炒作有关病毒源头的阴谋论,对中国的疫情防控进行了无理的造谣。these accusations are unfounded, but Australia has been at the forefront, blaming China, which is the main reason for the deterioration of China-Australia relations. The deeper angle from the Chinese public diplomacy point of view is to change the topic, because uh, since Australia has been condemning China for COVID-19, then China can also find something to condemn the Australian government. I think the Chinese would understand that the U.S. has a problem with China because there is competition for supremacy. But they look at how much Australia depends on China economically. They just could not comprehend why Australia would be the one that's most anti-China. There's a huge media interest on Zhao Lijian's tweet, right? When, from Australia's perspective, China's actions in trade um, is much more significant to Australia's national interest. But the media loves this tweet story much more so than perhaps a bit more boring trade stories. Some of these bilateral issues predate the pandemic. In 2017, the government in Canberra proposed measures to deal with what it called disturbing reports of Chinese influence in Australia. Journalists on both sides have since come under increasing pressure. My name is Cheng Lei. I'm a TV anchor based in Beijing, China. In August, Cheng Lei, an Australian citizen of Chinese descent, based in Beijing for China's CGTN TV, disappeared from the airwaves and into custody, allegedly for endangering national security. The following month, two other Australian journalists based in China were questioned about the Cheng Lei case. Spooked at the prospect of getting arrested, they turned to Australian officials for help, got a diplomatic escort to the airport, and fled the country. Bill, is it a relief to be back in Australia? Two Australian journalists, Bill Bertles and Mike Smith, were rushed out suddenly uh, a couple of months ago. Now, the public claim in those cases was their connection to Cheng Lei. They were questioned by Chinese state security about their connection with her. It only emerged when they returned to Australia that the Australian spy agency, ASIO, had executed search warrants on Chinese journalists in Australia. The Chinese journalists were raided um, in connection with a foreign interference investigation of a politician. But that raid was not reported at the time, and only emerged after Bill Bertels and Michael Smith was questioned by Chinese authorities. The four Chinese journalists left Australia shortly after the incidents. Chinese news outlets, not known for examining current human rights abuses at home, have developed a sudden, sustained interest in the Australian military's track record in Afghanistan years ago. They've relied on foreign ministry officials for interviews and used the tweeted image knowing it's a fake created by a Chinese artist, without calling it what it is. Wuhan virus 2.0 or whatever the heck's going to be coming. Australian news platforms reflect their government's hostility towards Beijing in their own ways, the tendency to label COVID-19 the Chinese virus, 
with the Rupert Murdoch-owned Sky News Australia stirring the pot, not unlike the channel he owns in the US, Fox News. The two media spheres conduct their journalism largely or entirely without the benefit of correspondence on the other's turf. The biggest problem, in my view, is the bias. When you are not in China and you are reporting on China, it's very difficult to avoid your pre-existing bias to dominate your analysis. And I think the same is true from the Chinese media, that when there is a political message from the headquarters saying that, hey, you must report on Australia this way. We don't want good news. We only want bad news. Then the reporting is not going to sufficiently inform either the general public or the decision makers in either country. We've got huge gaps in coverage now. The loudest voices uh, will now get the most attention. And that means that we often hear, you know, from the top levels of government, basically shouting each other from Canberra and Beijing. And what we're missing there, both in the lack of Australian journalists in China and the loss of some Chinese journalists in Australia, is that nuance. We don't get a sense of what people on the ground feel and think. We just get diplomats talking at each other. And that's a great loss. Uganda has an election coming up next month, and President Yoweri Museveni, who's been in power for more than three decades, is up against an opponent with a significant following. Flo Phillips has been tracking this story for us, speaking with journalists in Kampala. Flo, how has Museveni been dealing with this challenge? In short, Richard, by clamping down on the opposition candidate, Robert Chagellany, known as Bobby Wine, on the journalist covering Wine's campaign and targeting some of his supporters. Wine is a different kind of opponent for the president. He's a musician turned member of parliament, a singer who's used his music to power his campaign, as well as connect with young voters and broaden his support base. Last month, dozens of Wine's supporters were killed at the hands of the Ugandan security services, and there have been multiple reports since of police firing tear gas and rubber bullets at them. Check out this video Wine posted on Twitter from this past Tuesday, showing police targeting him and his campaign team as they were arriving at a rally. Both his producer and his bodyguard sustained some serious injuries. Journalists have been amongst the casualties. Were they simply caught in the middle of all this? It's more targeted than that. One journalist, Moses Boyo, told us that he was hit in the face with a rubber bullet while he was trying to put together a documentary that he's making about Bobby Wine. Others say they've been beaten by police or pepper sprayed by them. And the latest from the Press Freedom Group, Reporters Without Borders, counts a total of nine physical attacks and four arrests all since the beginning of November. Let's talk about some of the foreign reporters who have been trying to cover this story, who've also attracted the attention of the Ugandan authorities. Earlier this week, police at one of Bobby Wine's rallies reportedly shot at a producer who was working for one of the UK broadcasters, hitting her in the hip. The Museveni government have also deported a news crew from the Canadian broadcaster, CBC. Now, the official reason that was given was that they were working under tourist visas, although they maintained that they followed all the relevant rules. One more important thing to note on this election, Richard, the timing. It was originally scheduled for February, but the Museveni government have moved it up a month to January 14th. They did that with one eye on what's been unfolding in Washington. The inauguration in DC is set for just six days later on January 20th, and President Museveni seems to be keeping his options open. Given the prospect of possible vote rigging and more election-related violence, these are the kind of tactics that might be easier to get away with under President Trump than President Biden. Okay, thanks, Flo. It's been roughly 20 years since the war finally came to an end in what was once known as Yugoslavia. The historical narrative of Serbia's role in that conflict, Europe's deadliest since World War II, is contested. And it really shouldn't be. The evidence, as per the United Nations and multiple other investigative bodies, tells a tale of disproportionate Serbian aggression, brutality, and ethnic cleansing. The alternative version of that history is now being told in book form by Serbian authors who have been convicted of war crimes that include genocide. The convicts turned writers, former military generals and politicians, 
aren't just out for exoneration. They want to rewrite the historical record while feeding into nationalistic narratives favored by Serbian elites, including television channels, which might explain the popularity of the books in Belgrade. The Listening Post's Johanna Hus now on historical revisionism, the literary kind in Serbia. Autobiographies, war memoirs, novels, even poetry. More than 120 books written from behind bars by at least 22 alleged and convicted war criminals. This literary output has been coming out of the detention center of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the ICTY, since 1993. The scope of literature coming from the ICTY is astounding. Given that the ICTY indicted 161 persons as a whole, out of which about 140 actually went into the Sjeveningen, which is a detention unit of the Hague Tribunal, you can say that every one in six prisoners of the ICTY turned out to be an author of some kind. Many of those people are writing for purely political reasons, for propaganda reasons. There is a certain, certain insistence on exonerating yourself. Some of it is obviously also creating a parallel narrative, which is only a part of a systematic approach in which actual facts, actual events that have taken place are now being questioned. And they don't care about facts. And they don't care what you or I think about it. This is tailor-made for the Serbs. And it's made in a way that would fit in the pre-existing narratives of what Yugoslavia was, of what and who the Serbs are. It's about stories. Stories make nations. Radovan Karadzic is not going to be remembered as a murdering, genocidal maniac but as a great Serbian hero who actually made the first Serb state on the left bank of the Dina River. Nebojša Pavkovic is going to be remembered by future generations of Serbs not as a murderer of Albanian children in Kosovo, but as a great war hero who stood up to NATO. End of story. Revisionist books written by convicted war criminals are commonly available here in the Serbian capital, Belgrade including the bookstore behind me, which belongs to the Ministry of Defence. But these books don't just do well with the average Serb. The country's politicians, including those in government, are big fans too. In 2018, the publishing arm of Serbia's Defence Ministry took to Belgrade's yearly book fair to promote its newest release, Merciful Angels Embrace, the multi-volume wartime diary written by former army general Nebojša Pavković who is currently serving a 22-year prison sentence for crimes against humanity, details his experiences in the Kosovo War. His presence at the prestigious fair speaks to the popularity of his nationalist message, a narrative that 19 years after the end of the war is still actively endorsed by those in power. Those who were convicted in the Hague Tribunal are widely seen as heroes in their communities. And in Serbia, many of those who participated in making decisions during the war are now in power, and they benefit from promoting these kinds of false messages and narratives. For instance, Pavkovic's books that are promoted by the Ministry of Defense offer blow-by-blow -blow accounts of the NATO bombing during the Kosovo War. However, they omit the crimes committed by the Serbs. These books are an attempt to completely ignore the Albanian victims, to keep war crimes silent, and to present the NATO bombing as a hostile attack by international forces, in which only innocent Serbs were killed. When it comes to some of the books, we know that, for instance, Aleksandar Vucic, the current president of Serbia, wrote a couple of forewords to some of the editions. Now, if you have a legitimate representative of a country, you know, write a foreword for books of an alleged war criminal, that is a huge issue. But I think that tells you a lot about just how far, um, you know, the current political structures will go in order to push this narrative onto the public. 
Serbian media play a significant role in bolstering revisionist narratives in the country. In November 2018, former Bosnian Serb army commander Ratko Mladic, who is serving a life sentence for war crimes and genocide, dialed into a morning breakfast show on Serbia's privately owned entertainment channel Happy TV, sending love to the nation from prison. Ratko <laughs> Mladic himself phoned in from The Hague and finished the conversation by saying, you know, <laughs> uh, most of the media see themselves as organs of state. They see themselves as being part of the Serbian cause and contributing to the Serbian cause, which is the only way you can explain having Gratko Mladic phone in into a morning talk show, having just been found guilty of genocide. Speak of normalization, huh? The Srebrenica genocide, which took place here in 1995, is by far the most popular topic for historical revisionists. The execution of at least 8,000 Muslim men and boys at the hands of the Bosnian Serb security forces, the worst mass killing on European soil since the Second World War, is a huge stain on Bosnian Serb history and numerous books have been written about it by those wanting to recast the facts of that massacre. Srebrenica is by far the thorniest uh, issue among all discussed. Srebrenica is also by far the best prosecuted crime among all the crimes. In the 90s, it's proven beyond reasonable doubt that uh, culprits are the leadership of army of Bosnian Serbs. And I didn't wonder how come that uh, judicial facts which had been so well established are facing the stone wall. What does it take, actually? It's a question that those pushing back against these revisionist narratives, whether about Srebrenica or any other brutal episode in the Yugoslav Wars, have been asking themselves for years. But as long as these rewrites of history are not only condoned, but actively endorsed by those in power, attempts to tell the facts as they are are falling on deaf ears. Me. Right now, we don't have a young generation politically mature enough to ask important questions or inquire about facts that are being hidden. My generation, which was trying to create a consciousness about these crimes and the people behind them, well, we have been defeated. We weren't able to win back the narrative. We couldn't make the media follow this up. And the crimes, those responsible for them, the peace agreements, these have been completely removed from the agenda. In its place, we have this populism on the rise, and there seems no space for pushback. As a survivor of Srebrenica, as a survivor of one genocidal episode, the first emotion that comes is anger. Then disbelief. And then resolve to fight that. We're dealing with regimes that don't have a problem explaining to their own electorate why they're spending mil millions on genocide denial. People have actually managed to move on from their own experience in the 90s. And that's the experience of being shot at, being killed, losing your relative, losing your father, losing your brother, mother, sister, whatever. But the people who did that to them have not moved an inch. Denying a past genocide is never just about denying genocide in the past. It's about planning and ho or hoping for the next one. Otherwise, why do it? Why glorify genocidal maniacs? Why glorify mass murderers unless you're prepared to repeat it? And finally, before the advent of the World Wide Web, who knew how hard it would be to prove that you're not a robot? Verifying online that you're actually human by ticking those picture boxes or trying to read those bits of text that can look like hieroglyphics? It's no wonder that we sometimes fail the test. And by the way, you know who's putting us to the test? 
robots. Hardly seems fair. British writer and comedian Stevie Martin feels our pain. She lays it all out in this next video. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Hi, I just want to send this file. We need to confirm you're not a robot. Okay. Are you a robot? No. That's exactly what a robot would say. So can you also tick this box to confirm you're not a robot? Could a robot not have done that? No. Type the letters and numbers you see in the picture below. E seven. It's incorrect. Would you like to try again? Yes, please. I can't see anything. Okay, just check every box that has a traffic light in it. I've checked them. I'm afraid you failed. Would you like to try again? Yeah, I've definitely checked them all. There was one behind the wall. How would I have known that? Now I'll tick every box that has a car in it. I can't see anything. Uh, right, my right, and middle, your middle. No. Can I have another go? No. Why? We've emailed you a code. Okay, I've got it through. I'm just gonna type it in now. I'm afraid you typed that incorrectly. Oh. We'll send you another code. By email? No, look outside your window. Can you see a man? What? He has the code. Go and get it from him. Five, six, eight, seven, three, four. That's incorrect. I chased that man for three miles. He jumped into the Thames. Are you sure it was the right man? Yeah, I'm sure. Six, seven, eight, five, six, seven. I'm afraid that's timed out.